Welcome to the fourth week of Advent. Today, we light four candles. first candle is a reminder of the light of hope of the prophets. The second candle is a symbol of the light and warmth Joseph and Mary found in the stable. The third candle reminds us of the great light and joy which surrounded the shepherds at the announcement of Jesus' birth. The fourth candle reminds us of the light of the stars in the sky which guided the wise men to Jesus and which keeps watch over us by night. Today, today's hymn from our chorus is We Three Kings.
God, we think of Christmas, we think of love and lights and gifts and happy times. But most of all, we think of Jesus born in a manger and grown up as a loving teacher. Help us to live the way Jesus reaches us so that we may show the real meaning of Christmas. Amen. Today's Bible reading is out of Luke 2 through 7. For those that have your Bibles, and this taxing was first made when Cyrenus was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, even one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judah, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. So being the fourth week of Advent, we're going to talk about Mary and Joseph this week. So pretend with me, please, like a child pretends. Pretend you are, are in the balcony in heaven, looking over the Christmas events as described in Luke's Gospel. How would you evaluate the performance of the innkeeper? Would you hold up a 3, a 5, an 8, or a 10? Would you have forced Mary and Joseph to find lodging in the stable in which Jesus was born? Remember singing as children, No Room, No Room for Christ of Bethlehem. Or do you throw somebody else out so Mary and Joseph can get in? Surprisingly, the Gospel of Luke makes no mention of the innkeeper at all, only that she wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there is no room for them in the inn. The word translated inn in Luke 2 is used for many types of lodging, including a guest room in a home. It is possible, you see, that Joseph had a relative in Bethlehem and hoped to stay in their guest room only to find it already taken. But let's assume that the inn spoken of was like a small country inn. How would you grade the innkeeper? For myself, I'm going to give the innkeeper, the host or hostess, a 10. Amidst a situation that was almost completely out of their hands, they found a place for Christ to be born. And the world has been blessed ever since. Now pretend you are the host who must decide what to do with Mary, Joseph, and Jesus on that first Christmas. What would you do? And come to think of it, in a larger way, we are still host to Jesus, aren't we? We are, we are the innkeeper of our own hearts deciding where to put Jesus. Suppose God took you or me to the door of our own hearts this Christmas and asked us, What do you see? This is, this is the way God used to do with the prophets. What do you see? The prophet would answer and then God would teach. Suppose God asked us, What do you see this Christmas? We might say we see wars and rumors of wars, hate, re hate reaching new intensity around the world, and government intrigue of historic proportions. We feel so helpless. We cannot control what happens in Washington, whether bombs are dropped, what bin Laden does. God might say, before we get to the serious stuff, I need you to realize not all of the news has been bad. Look at that piece of paper. I want you to know I have a sense of humor. We read the paper and smiled. The news is especially helpful at Christmas. Especially helpful, yes. Did you read where tests show that those who eat chocolate live longer? Surely, if I... But seriously, looking out, looking out from the door of the inn as the innkeeper, our world is a peck of trouble. The headlines do not use words like peace and joy and living longer. They speak of bombs, of the impeachment of the uh, of the president, of the rising, and of rising feeling against Americans around the world. <coughs> Perhaps it is a good time to pray for all Americans abroad, but especially our missionaries for whom danger has suddenly and severely escalated. Our prayers are needed. Remember that contrary to popular notion, the devil owns this world, just as he boasted during the temptation of Jesus. 
Our prayers, our attitudes, our actions are crucial to keep the evil one at bay. God comes to us and asks, does your faith come from the headlines or from the belief that I am doing my thing in unexpected places? Within unexpected people in ways you will never recognize. And you have to believe that, trust that, and live that, or you will become a walking nervous wreck. We think, all, we think about it and realize that the good news about Christmas is not that God waved the magic wand and created peace everywhere. A after, after the first Christmas, it is rather that God is working in unexpected places in the most difficult of times, in the most unlikely people. In the end, God will win out. Luke begins with the most unexpected of all miracles. The birth of the Messiah to a young Jewish maiden that had made the trip to Bethlehem because Joseph's ancestries led him back to Bethlehem. God says, look at Bethlehem and what do you see? We answer, we see the hills where a thousand years before David tended his sheep, where he fought the lion and the bear. We see the place where Samuel sought the young David out the left out son, the eighth son, and choose him to be king of Israel. These are the hills where David entertained himself with singing, with poetry, with praying, all of which we find in the Psalms. God answers, we said, now if I know about a forgotten boy named David on a Judean hillside, do you not believe I know you too? I do not believe Ben Laden is any greater than Goliath. God says, read for my friend Luke, please. We read, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. God says, please put human feelings in these two. You sanitize them. You dehumanize them. You've put them on Christmas cards and robbed yourselves of the inspiration of their courage. God says, look at Mary and let her agony be real for you. Mary had a baby in a dreadful situation. She is exhausted. She is wiped out. Her eyes are moist and the tears of, with the tears of childbirth. Her robes are dusty from the journey and now stained with the effort of birthing a child. It is on all counts, an unthinkable situation. The long journey, the exhaustion, the great pain of giving birth, the isolation of being away from home. It is all so out of joint, so unthinkable, so not right at all. But with my help and her courage, we did it. You are on holy ground. Are you telling me your situation is worse than hers? And Joseph in your Christmas card picture, Joseph stands like a sober theologian looking everything over like an interested professor who just stepped out of his office. God says, don't you realize he has just helped Mary give birth to her son? He was an incredible man, strong but tender. He was one of these quiet types who keep the spiritual world turning. I have many Josephs everywhere. God says, what do you see from the door of your inn? We reply, we, we, we see people we did not expect to see at your first Christmas celebration. God smiles and says, surprised you, didn't I? Working in people you would never approve of. Like who, we reply. God says, look carefully, what do you see? We look and behold, there is Caesar Augustus, the hated Roman emperor, who claimed for himself deity. He had his strong points, but he was hardly the kind of person you would like to go fishing in the mountains with. But Luke saw it, saw it clearly. The promise of God came true because of a decree from the hated Roman government. God was working his promise, not only through Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph and the shepherds, but through Caesar Augustus, the emperor, had become an unknowing participant in a salvation that would someday bring down his empire. God says, look again. I want you to see the first set of worshipers for the Messiah. We look and we frown. Shepherds. They never take baths. They never go to the temple on the Sabbath. Why not? 
why not work in a few doctors of theologically like our pastor and a few professors from the nearby seminary? Why shepherds? Then God said, when you are ready to worship like they worship, you are ready to begin loving the people of the world like I love them. And what about us? Can we stand at the end of our hearts and find ways for the Christ this Christmas? So much in this world we have no control over, but we do have control over whether Christ gets born in a manger of our own hearts. It takes some inventing, some imagination, maybe even some courage, but finding a place for Christ in the midst of all the givens is what Christ is all about. You say, I can't do that. I'm not good at being a saint. I don't know how to find Christ this Christmas. Let me tell you a story I read of a wife named Doris who in her own way was an innkeeper for her own family. Her husband Mike had grown to dread Christmas, not the real meaning of it, but the commercialism of it. The peace, the, the pace, the stress, the overspending, the trying to find something to get everyone. So that year his wife decided to try and redeem Christmas for Mike. The inspiration came in an unusual way. Their son Kevin, who was wrestling in the junior league, had a non-league match against a team sponsored by an inner city church. Dressed in sneakers that were ragged, that were in sharp contrast to the blue and gold uniforms Kevin and his team wore, as the match began, Doris was alarmed to notice that the other team was wrestling without headgear, designed to protect the wrestler's ears. It was a luxury the inner city team obviously was just, just could not afford. Kevin's team wound up winning everything. Mike shook his head and said, I wish just one of them could have won. They have a lot of potential, but losing like this could take the heart right out of them. Mike, you see, loved kids. He had coached Little League football, baseball, and lacrosse. He really empath empathized with the losers. That was the inspiration Doris needed. That afternoon she went to the local sporting goods store and brought an assortment of wrestling headgear and shoes and sent them anonymously to the inner city church. On Christmas Eve she placed a white envelope on the tree with her husband Mike's name on it. Inside a note described what Doris had done and that this was the gift from Doris. Mike's smile was the brightest of all that Christmas and it began a tradition. Each year there was a white envelope on the tree waiting to be opened. One year she sent a group of handicapped youngsters to a hockey game. Another year a check to a pair of elderly brothers whose house had burned to the ground and so on. The white envelope became the highlight of their Christmas. It was always the last thing opened on Christmas morning and the children ignoring their toys for a minute would stand with wide-eyed anticipation as their dad lifted the envelope from the tree to reveal its contents. As the years went by Toys were replaced with other presents, but the envelope never lost its allure. But the story doesn't end there. You see, about a year and a half ago, Mike died due to cancer. When Christmas rolled around, Doris was so wrapped in grief, she barely got the tree up. But Christmas Eve found her putting a white envelope on the tree. In the morning, it was joined by three more. Each of the children, unbeknownst to the others, had placed an envelope on the tree for their dad each an anonymous contribution to someone who needed it. I give Doris and the innkeeper a 10. In the midst of all things they had no control over, they still made a place for Christ. The innkeeper remembered the manger and he made a place for Christ there. Doris invented a miracle in a white envelope. In closing, this Christmas there is so much we cannot control. The world sometimes seems like it has come off its hinges, but there is a manger somewhere, no idea, but ready and willing to be discovered, a place for Christ to bring miracles. Maybe the place to begin is with the entrance to our own hearts, the openness and the willingness to let Christ in, the openness and willingness to say yes to what Christ wants us to do. And now at this time, Pastor Jessica with our benediction and, and a small poem. <clears throat> oh. Where is 
benediction. <coughs> be good, please. <coughs> Dear God, all, all, all over the world now, the children of Holy Mother Church are singing, Send them dew from above your heavens, let the skies pour down upon us, the rain we long for, him just one. May, may he, the Savior, spring from the cl closed womb of the earth. May we know, Lord, and we have seen what drought does to the land. We know, we know it too, and have seen it, the, rain, the rages of frost and cold. We have walked in the barren fields and dried up hills. <clears> Through <throat> up silent woods and lifeless valleys. Among the thirsty bends, once flowing streams, we have seen clearly etched upon us, upon the land. We are, <clears throat> we are life would be without you. We can understand now how we should live for your coming. Come, dear, come, dear Lord and Savior, do not delay. Rise up in your power and come. Let the rain of your grace water in the parched soils of our souls, and let the warmth of your love thaw the coldness of our indifference. Let the life of your blood in your body vitalize our dead, deadened urges and stir, and stir up to fruitless labor in your vineyard. O Eternal Father, rouse our hearts out of out of sleep of sin, so that we may clear the path for your Son and our souls. Each year, each year in Advent, we <coughs> glander us. You glander us with the thought of our redemption. Grant grant us and grant us. We pray for you that we receive your Son, our Redeemer, now and may and may in the future gladly and confidently meet him as our judge. Amen. <clears throat> as for the small... Let me just make one announcement small. before you do this. Okay. Um, for those online, I almost forgot, Friday is Christmas Eve. We will be doing a live service at midnight along with um, communion. So those online who want to bring your bread and your wine and your juice or whatever, that you can follow along with communion uh, communion with us. That will be Christmas Eve Midnight Mass. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> and a small poem I like to read um, is written by um, Steve Caparezzo, one of our weathermen here in Albany, New York, a um, long time ago. It's for pets who don't have any homes for Christmas. <clears throat> it's called When I Close My Eyes. There was once a time I was so happy and free. You were my friend, beside, by your side I would be. Something went wrong, I just don't know when. Now I'm all alone in this room called a pen. I know it's not home, it's a place that I fear. When the lights go out, I sleep with a tear. When I close my eyes, I dream of the sun. I feel the breeze in the field where I, that I run. As we walked to the pond, I was at your side. We were friends. I loved you with pride. We sat at the couch. We sat on the couch, and I touched your hand. You rubbed my chin. I was soft the same. I was so happy just to be next to you. Now my life is confused. What can I do? This is so, this so much I can give. So much I can say. No one left to love me. No one to play. Now I open my eyes and I see such pain. I cry for you, but within but my tries in vain. I glance to the left. I glance to the right. There's so many like me who share this plight. As each day goes on, it gets harder to live. I may be weak, 
but there's still love I can give. As the day drags on and the lights grow dim, I lay on the floor for my future's groom. When I close my eyes, it could be my last. Please save me now and bring back my past.